service. Uh, get started. Uh, today, our text will be 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 5 through 12. You can turn there if you're not there already. And once you do, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. The Apostle Paul is writing, and by the Holy Spirit says, verse 5, After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps, verse 6, I will stay with you for a while, or even spend the winter, so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now, <laughs> don't take it personal, and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But, verse 8, I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost, because a great door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many who oppose me. When Timothy comes, verse 10, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. No one, then, should treat him with contempt. Send him on his way in peace, so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, verse 12. I strongly urged him to go to you with the brothers. He was quite unwilling to go now, but he will go when he has the opportunity. Let's pray. We'll ask God's blessing on our time together in his word, if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we're wanting to posture ourselves this morning before you humbly and simply with ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to receive. Lord, we don't want our time together in your word to be a waste of time. We're looking to you to speak into our lives in and through your word. So Lord, will you? We ask you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So the title I've chosen for today's teaching is Characteristics of Wise Planning. And the reason I chose that title is that in today's text, the Apostle Paul is going to provide us with a glimpse into his own future plans, his own future travel plans. And as such, we have a biblical template of sorts, uh, if I can call it that. And this template is, I think, for us to understand how it is that we're to make wise plans for our future as we occupy until the Lord comes. Our first characteristic of wise planning, and I found three, you might find more, but the first one is this, having plans is biblical. Well, now that might sound like a firm grasp of the obvious, but uh, there are those who would beg to differ. Sadly, many have associated planning for the future with a lack of faith, that we're just to trust God. <laughs> However, in verses 5 and 6, we clearly see that not only is planning wise, it's biblical. In verse 5, Paul begins by telling them of his future plans. He says that after he goes through Macedonia, he will come to them there in Corinth. At least that's his plan anyway. And in verse 6, he then says that perhaps he'll stay with them for a while or spend the winter with them so they can help him wherever he goes. Well, I would suggest that Paul's wise planning has at its core the wisdom of the Proverbs specifically as it relates to planning. The truth of the matter is, is that the Proverbs are replete with verses about the wisdom of planning. Proverbs 20:18 says, plans are established by counsel. By wise counsel, wage war. Proverbs 21:5 says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Proverbs 15, says, 
Without counsel, counsel, plans go awry, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs 16, 9 says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And Proverbs 19, 29, or 21, one of my favorites says, there are many plans in a man's heart, nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. In other words, we can have plans, but we need to hold on to those plans like this and not like this. I think of last week in our text, we were talking about money. And Paul was addressing this issue of collecting, or perhaps better said, receiving the tithes and the offerings. And I see money the same way I see planning. Uh, just like with money, it's okay to have it, but don't let it have you. And the same thing is true with plans. Have plans, but don't let those plans have you. You need to hold on to them very loosely, which is what we see with our second characteristic in verses 7 through 9, which is that of wise planning needing to be flexible. In verse 7, Paul tells the Corinthians that he doesn't want to see him now. However, if the Lord permits, in other words, Lord willing, he hopes to spend some time with them after he makes this passing visit. And in verse 8, he goes on to say that instead of spending time with them in Corinth, his plan is to spend time at Ephesus until the Feast of Pentecost. And then in verse 9, he explains why, saying it's because a great door for effective work has been opened up to him, even though, and this is interesting, and I want to talk about this in a moment, even though many oppose him. There was much opposition against Paul. I find it rather interesting that Paul would hold on loosely to his plans under the banner of whether or not the Lord will permit it. This is the fact of the matter. We should couch everything with Lord willing. If the Lord permits, if the Lord wills. This speaks to the paramount importance of Again, having plans, but not holding on too tightly to them. In other words, don't let the plans have you in the sense that you don't give God the opportunity to interrupt them. Um, how many of you have ever had God interrupt your plans? <laughs> That's what I thought. I know for me, God has ruined many plans that I had, which I thought were fabulous, by the way. And I even told him, Lord, this is a great plan. Just bless it, will you? And the problem with that approach is, is that what if that's not God's plan? What if my plan is not compatible with God's plan? And actually, interrupting Paul's plans is exactly what God did, and here's why. Do you realize that none of Paul's plans that we read about in our text today actually came to pass? He, he never did anything that he had planned to do that he writes to the Corinthian church. Not one single plan came to fruition. <laughs> Boy, I could fill up a few volumes with all of the plans that I had, fabulous plans that I had that God interrupted and actually ruined. And I'm not complaining. I'm so glad he did. In retrospect, I look back at what God did in interrupting those plans, and I realize all too well and all too often how it is that God had something better. God will never ruin a plan unless he has a better plan, a higher plan for you. Well, the lesson here is quite clear, which is that oftentimes our plans are not compatible with God's will, and when they're not, God will simply say no. I like how one said it. If the request is wrong, God says no. If the timing is wrong, God says slow. If I'm wrong, God says grow. But if the timing is right, and I'm right, and the request is right, God says go. Here you go. This is my will. This is my time. Oftentimes, 
our plans might be according to his plans and according to his will, but it may not be the time for that plan. And so God is, I believe, wanting for us to rest in him and trust in him. And uh, actually, James speaks to this concerning the Lord's will in chapter 4. I'll read verses 13 through 16. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit. Whereas, verse 14, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills. We shall live and do this or do that. But now you boast in your arrogance. And if you think about it, it is arrogant to impose our plans upon God's will. And James says, all such boasting is evil. It's been said that God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. I know that sounds kind of cliche, but it's something that I've experienced in my own life. Sometimes God will delay for good reason. I like what Isaiah says, that God will delay to be gracious unto you. God's delays are by God's design, and we should not necessarily interpret God's delays as being God's denials. It's also been said that oftentimes God will direct our steps and our stops. I think of Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, that very famous passage in Proverbs about not leaning to our own understanding, acknowledging the Lord in all of our ways and trusting the Lord with all of our heart. And if we do those three things, the promise is that he will direct our paths. I like how one translation renders it. He will make our paths straight. Kind of carries with it the idea of he will straighten out the mess we're in. <laughs> straighten out the mess we've gotten ourselves into. One of Pastor Chuck's Chuckisms, as we affectionately referred to them, was, Blessed are the flexible, for they shall not be broken. That's not a Bible verse, but it's a great beatitude. In other words, be flexible. Because you have to give God editing rights, so to speak, on your plans. You have to give those plans to him and say, Oh Lord, this is my will. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will be done. Lord, what do you want? Because I know that what you want will always be best for me. See, I don't, like you, Lord, see the end from the beginning, so I don't know what's best for me. I think I know what's best for me, but Lord, ultimately, you know in the end what is best for me. G. Campbell Morgan sort of echoed this, writing, I know the fascination of having a plan and having everything in order and knowing where we are going, but let us leave room at any rate for the, and I love this, interference of God. <laughs> in other words, God's going to interfere. God's going to interrupt, and this brings us to our third characteristic of wise planning in verses 10 through 12, which is that wise planning can be very difficult. I want us to spend the remainder of our time on this for uh, a reason. I think you'll see why here in a moment. In verse 10, Paul tells them that when Timothy comes, they're to see to it that he's not intimidated or mistreated, not treated with contempt. Keep in mind now, Timothy was a young pastor, uh, under the Apostle Paul's wing, but he was easily intimidated. He was a very timid and shy guy. And it was really, you know, a thing of people sort of taking advantage of that. And he was a sensitive guy. And so he did not want the Corinthians to mistreat uh, Timothy. And he says, I'm expecting his return as if to say, in one piece. <laughs> Be nice to this guy, okay? In verse 12, he says that he strongly urged Apollos to go to them with the brothers, but he was quite unwilling 
until he has a more convenient and opportune time. Again, that opportune and convenient time would never come, again, because none of Paul's plans came to fruition. In my own personal experience, I'm learning that this is one of the most important principles when it comes to wise planning. I have plans. I have long-term plans. I have short-range plans. And again, I, I'm learning. I haven't learned. I'm learning. I, I wish I could stand before you and say, I've arrived. <laughs> I've learned this. No, I'm still learning this. But I'm learning to just really trust that the Lord is in the plan. As long as I submit it and commit it to him. But one of the things I'm learning is that both the process of planning and the final product from planning can and usually are very difficult. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Not only is the planning process riddled with difficulty, it takes work, but the outcome of the planning can also be very difficult. And here's why I say that. We're all prone to think that just because our plans are riddled with difficulty, it must be an indicator that we're not in God's will. Somehow we've bought into this notion that God's will will be um, such that everything is smooth sailing. And boy, when adversity strikes, I must not be in God's will. This must not be God's plan. I must not have heard God. And the problem with that is, is that many times our plans, when God's will, are accompanied with difficulty and opposition. And if you are honest with yourself, <laughs> you have to admit that it's only when things aren't going our way that God grows our faith and develops and produces in us, as James also writes, that perseverance and that character. Isaiah 48 verse 10, one of my, one of the most disturbing verses in all of the Bible to me. It says, Behold, I have refined thee, but not with silver. I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. Is that not what James says? That he's chosen those fiery trials in life to purify our faith, like the goldsmith who subjects the gold to intense heat, the intense heat from the fire, so that all of the impurities within that gold come to the surface, so that the goldsmith may then scrape it off and know that he has pure gold when he can see his image in that gold. And so too does God do that with us. He subjects us to that intense heat, those fiery trials. You know, when things are going well, I, I, I'm on my way. Praise the Lord. Even, it even shows up in my prayer life. I mean, my, my prayers become just sort of generic. Lord, bless me, bless them, bless this. Amen. Wow. But boy, let adversity strike, and it changes the whole complexion of your prayer. Oh, Lord! Oh, God! Why are you doing this to me? He's not doing anything to you. He's doing very much in you and even for you. We are the clay, and he's the potter, right? Do you ever stop to wonder what the implications of that are? You know how the potter takes that clay and puts it on the spinning wheel and spins it around really fast? and sticks its hand ever so strongly and powerfully into the center to get out all of the gook. And then you're spinning around like this as God has got you on that wheel. And then when the wheel starts slowing down, you think, oh, thank you, Lord. 
Thank you, Lord, it's over. No, it's not. He's going to take that clay vessel and he's going to stick it in the kiln, appropriately named. <laughs> You're killing me, God. You're killing me. And he turns the heat up in that oven to finish the work that he has begun. And then we're told in the scriptures that he takes that vessel that he has made and shaped and fashioned and he puts his name on it. We are his workmanship. And it's an interesting word, poema, in the original language. It's where we get our word poem. We become this, he takes clay and makes it into a beautiful, magnificent, and usable vessel. And that's what God is always doing in our lives. And by the way, this is Romans 8, 29, it, which comes, I know this is deeply profound, after verse 28. 29 comes after verse 28, but Romans 8, 28 is that famous passage that we quote, we have memorized, for we know that God works all things together for the good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. Well, it's verse 29 that tells us what his purpose is. You know what his purpose is? It's to conform us, transform us, fashion us, make us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what God is doing in yours and my life. And that's why God allows the fiery trials in our lives. I want to get back to this dynamic of opposition that Paul talks about here in the context of his plans. Another thing I'm learning is that the greatest of opportunities in life will come packaged with the greatest oppositions in life. In fact, in, in some cases, I would even venture to say that that becomes the litmus test. By virtue of the opposition, uh, I'm beginning to see it in a new way that the opposition is a validation and authentication that I am, in fact, in God's will. I'll take it even further and say that when there's no opposition and all men are speaking well of me and everything's going just smashingly, um, maybe you're not in God's will. Beware, Jesus said, when all men speak well of you, when there's no opposition. When, like Nehemiah, you don't have any Sanballats or Tobias that are opposing you and opposing the work that God is doing in your life, in and through your life. I like how one said it, never doubt in the dark what God showed you in the light. And boy, is that not how it is for us? When we start encountering adversity and opposition, we start doubting, did I, did I hear the Lord on this? Is this the Lord's will? Maybe I got ahead of the Lord. Maybe I didn't really hear the Lord. Maybe this is what I wanted to do. Maybe this isn't what the Lord wanted me to do. Here's the thing. I can be right smack in the middle of the trial of my life and yet be right smack in the middle of God's will for my life. I think about when my wife and I first came here. We started all over, sold everything, on the mainland, packed a container and had it shipped and rented a house and, and uh, just waited on the Lord. And the first two years were just brutal. I don't know how else to say it. Just brutal. And we had just planted this church. This is the year 2005. We had started a Bible study in 2004. And as soon as we got this beautiful church to rent in 2005 and started doing our Sunday morning services earlier that year, it's like all of a sudden adversity just began to strike in every possible way. One of the uh, darkest times was when 
we learned that our daughter would be born with uh, trisomy 18, which the physician said was incompatible with life. And I'll tell you, those are some pretty rough times. I remember driving to church, had to leave my cell phone on because my wife and I would sleep in shifts because we didn't know when she was going to die. We just knew that she was going to die. And so if it looked like it was time, my wife was to call me because we both wanted to be there when Noel went home to be with the Lord. But I got to be very candid with you and say to you that I would stand behind actually this, well, we had a different pulpit at the time, but I was standing right here looking at my phone, wondering if I was going to get the call. And I'm looking out to this precious, new, very small church. There's only a few people, 15, 20, went eventually to 30, 40 people. And I just began to entertain these doubts from the enemy. It wasn't the Lord's will that you come to Hawaii. You just wanted to come to Hawaii. I mean, who doesn't want to come to Hawaii, right? I mean, you, this, this wasn't the Lord. Look at what, what's happening in your life. Your, your daughter's going to die. And, and the jury's still out on whether or not this church is going to be blessed and even make it. And listen, innate within all of us is this ability to start kind of letting the enemy have his way with you. It, it goes back to the garden when the serpent said to Eve, questioning God, putting doubt in, in Eve's heart, hath God said? Hath God said? How do you know? How do you know? This isn't the Lord. This is you. And he got me thinking that I had made the absolute worst decision in my life. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. And one of the things that I've come to learn is that sometimes God will send you into the storm and just because it is perilous and difficult and extremely hard and even painful it doesn't mean that the Lord's not in it in fact if anything it is an indicator that he is probably in it the best example of this is in Matthew's gospel the 14th chapter I want to read verses 22 through 34. I know you're familiar with this account, but there's something here I think that we need to see. It says immediately, interesting word, immediately, like there was a hurry, an urgency. Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now, when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea, and when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But he immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Jesus is in the storm. <laughs> and Peter, I love Peter, answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and Beginning to sink, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. I love three-word prayers. <laughs> the Lord hears three-word prayers. Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you of little faith. And this is interesting. Why did you doubt? Never imagine a harsh tone in Jesus' voice when he says, Oh, you of little faith. I imagine the Savior saying this with a very loving tone. Your, your faith is so little. 
Why is it that you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. A couple of observations from this famous passage. The first of which is that Jesus knowingly sent them into the storm. He knowingly sent them into the midst of the Sea of Galilee, knowing that they would encounter a life-threatening storm. Why do I point that out? Because so too does the Lord do that for us. He sends us into the storm. It's his will that we're sent into the storm. The question is why? Well, this is interesting. I've heard this passage probably like you taught in so many ways and of course there are so many life lessons that we can derive from this but one of the best teachings I ever heard on this was as it relates to what happened before this. This was right after the feeding of the multitudes which is why Jesus we're told immediately wanted to even before he disbanded the multitudes. We're told that he got them immediately into the boat first, sent them into the Sea of Galilee knowingly into a storm, and then he di basically dismissed the crowds. Why? Here's the thought. The Lord was wanting to protect them from a greater trial. What do you mean? The Lord sent them into this trial immediately so as to protect them from the potential of a greater trial. <laughs> What's the greater trial? Oh, listen, if I'm there and I'm on the receiving end of a miracle to where I'm reaching in to a basket only to find more loaves, more fish, to feed what some estimate to be over 10,000. Wait a minute, I thought it was 4,000 one time, 5,000. Yes, but that's just the men. That didn't include the women and the children. You factor in the women and the children, you've got over 10,000 people there. And you've got a boy's sack lunch that his mom prepared for him who probably had no idea what Jesus was going to do with that lunch. And so I'm one of the disciples. And I'm reaching into this basket and feeding the multitudes. Um, I'm thinking to myself, hey, this is good that we stay here. Let's plant Calvary Chapel of the feeding of the multitudes here. We've got a, a mega church on day one. That's the problem. Jesus was protecting them from that trial, and that would have been a trial and a temptation by sending them into this trial and this storm. Sometimes the opposition is actually the validation that God is in it. He's in the storm. He has sent you into that storm probably for a reason that you do not see yet, but maybe one day will. I look back over the years, I've been walking with the Lord for over 30 years now, and I can just recount time after time where I just thought, God, surely I'm, I'm not in your will. And, and Lord, why are you allowing this to happen in my life? What good could you possibly work from this only to like Joseph realize on the tail end of it oh I see Lord I see what you had in mind what man meant for evil you worked for good you worked for good I think of of anyone in the pages of Scripture save the Lord himself who would have probably thought, man, God sh surely pulled my file and he's through with me and he has truly forsaken me. I mean, his brothers sell him for, you know, uh, pieces of silver, which was a type of 
the betrayal of Judas, by the way. And it was interesting, it was his brother Judah. Very interesting typology. And, and then he's left for dead, and then he ends up in Potiphar's house, and then he's betrayed again, and in the dungeon of a prison, and he's not remembered until the right time. And then he goes from, as one says, the pit to the pinnacle. But do you realize it was something like 17 years? 17 years from the time he had that dream to the time that God would ultimately fulfill it. 17 years. Think about that. What man means for evil, God works for good, and God does work all things together for the good to those of us who love him and are called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, thank you. <laughs> thank you for ruining Paul's plans here because it's a great lesson for us and it's something that we can take home with us and by the Holy Spirit begin the process of applying to our lives. Lord, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen.